Good morning. My name is Ian Thomas and I have two problems. Well, those that know me will know I have more than two problems, but two that I'm prepared to tell you about. The first is I'm a lawyer, but please don't hold that against me until at least 20 to 11. The second problem I have is that I'm English, but don't hold that against me for Brexit. Okay? And the English thing I can deal with because I'm half Welsh, so I can chop and change as it suits me. <coughs> what I want to do is I want to pick up on some points that have been mentioned already from Michael, from Alan, and also in the last um, session from um, Mike Gibney. What I would say is that Alan's paper for safe food is well worth a read. It very concisely puts in four or five pages some of the key issues. Um, and I think Alan was quite brave to try and suggest some solutions um, without the crystal ball that we've just mentioned a few minutes ago. Just some of the key topics I want to talk about. Um, will Brexit affect me? What's the current situation? The advisor's perspective. Now, for all of you in the room that are involved in food in any way, shape or form, I'm afraid to say law is important. Law is relevant and law is something that you need to know about. Now, whether you call it law or regulation doesn't matter. It's all important. And that's why you need lawyers. Or at least a lawyer, anyway. And especially one that's got a foot in this camp and a foot in that camp. The UK and Ireland. But I want to look at some practical issues for those of you that will be in business or are currently in business. Some concerns and implications. The border. Now, fundamentally, the border between the Republic and the North. Uh, and I know that Michael Bell later on will be looking at some particular issues that affect Northern Ireland. The shape of the post-Brexit world, well, as far as I know, the world will still be round after Brexit, okay? But we want to look at what it might look like for us. And then an action plan. Is there an action plan that we can put into place? Now, hard or soft? That might be a question you get at breakfast in a nice little bed and breakfast in Dingle. You have the choice, a hard egg or a soft egg. I'm afraid we don't have those choices with Brexit, do we? They're in the hands of other people. So will Brexit affect me, you, everybody in the EU, the UK and Ireland? Yes? No? Maybe? Not really thought about it. Does it really matter? The sun will still shine in the morning? Well, the sun might shine in the morning, but we hope it will. The ostrich approach. Uh, look, we'll give the impression that we're going to just bury our heads in the sand. And if I can use an Irishism for a second, sure, it'll be grand. <laughs> the English are worrying, worrying, worrying. The Irish will think it'll all work out. Now, from a food regulatory perspective, this is the key. It's the recital to Regulation 178 of 2002, the General Food Law Regulation. This is what EU food law is based on. This is the food ethos of the European Union. The free movement of safe and wholesome food. Two issues. Free movement, safe and wholesome. A high level of protection of human life and health should be assured in the pursuit of community policies. And I'll come back to that in a little while. So from an advisor's perspective, I get... I was about to say I receive a letter, but we don't do letters anymore. I receive an email from a client who is outside of the EU. West Coast of America, Australia, doesn't really matter. We would like to bring our product into the EU. Thank you. Um, what's the general regulatory framework? Fundamentally, and I think Alan mentioned mutual recognition, fundamentally we can see what type of product is, what regulation applies, once you get it into the EU, you should be okay, subject to various issues, perhaps about language, or I've put at the bottom there about enforcement. 
or penalty, but fundamentally we will know what the law is, whether it's between Newry and Dundalk or between here and any other part of the EU. And I can be pretty sure that I can tell them they can bring them into Ireland, bring them into the UK, we can then sell them around the EU. That's the current position. I can look at some case law, so if there's an issue about a label, a description, I can go to the case law of the Court of Justice and get an indication of how it's been interpreted under EU law. I can find some guidance, and then as I say at the bottom, the most fundamental things I'm concerned about is making sure that when it goes into Germany, there's a correct language translation, and to get a sense of how the German authorities will treat the product. Quite often the issue around that relates to things like food supplements, which are subject to a directive, not subject to a regulation. That fundamentally means that different EU countries can adopt slightly different rules around food supplements and around things like medicinal products. So what are the concerns then? That there will be influence this is from a UK perspective, influence without direct power. They will be followers. But all the uncertainties from a UK perspective will impact on the rest of the EU. There's uncertainty about long-term rules. Uncertainty about customers and suppliers. Food availability, food security. Setting the agenda the UK wants to set the agenda. It's like one of those old programmes I watched as a kid. It's a knockout. So the UK is, at the moment, being held on with a big elastic band, and they're running off because they think they can set the agenda. And what's happening is, bit by bit, they're being brought back to the reality that you can't set your own agenda. And we've said the B word for Brexit, the P word for politics, I'm afraid, are at the moment fundamentally intertwined. There will be a change in the risk profile. The risk profile for business and the risk profile for consumers. And that's one thing, the consumer risk profile increase is something that we cannot and must not allow to happen. So at the moment we've heard a little bit about the scheme, the European Union withdrawal bill. They've made it very clear that current EU regulations will stay. So the protection, uh, sorry, the provision of food information to consumers regulation 1169 of 2011, that will in effect stay. It'll be copied and pasted across. It will keep any UK law that has implemented perhaps an EU directive. But we're getting rid of the directives over there, and any change to EU law after B Day, and B Day is Brexit Day before you think it means anything else, B Day, we're not taking those on board in the UK either. An EU case law, that for me as a lawyer, and for you if you're in business, is incredibly important. At the moment, if I've got a product on the EU market and there's an issue about perhaps the label or some other issue, that issue will be determined by reference to an EU case law that has interpreted the regulation or the EU law. So at the moment, if I've got a product that's Dundalk and Newry, the principles of application will remain the same. Once the UK leaves, the UK has said, we are not having any of that nonsense from Europe. We are not going to follow UK, in the UK courts, decisions of the Court of Justice. We're taking back powers, they say, and what we have, the supremacy of EU law, is going by the wayside. So whereas now, product A, New, uh, Newry and Dundalk, same principles of application. After B-Day, product B, there is a risk that the courts in the UK 
will interpret the provisions relating to the product in a different way to everywhere else in Europe. Now, even if you just think of that at its most basic level, what are the implications for food businesses, labels, and getting it right? Divergence is the thing that we have to make sure does not go out like that. And that's when I mentioned politics. That's the big concern. And that's the big problem why the UK really doesn't really know what it wants to do. Forgive me, it knows what it wants to do, but it probably doesn't know how to get there. So some of the issues that we need to consider then, labelling and GIs. I've mentioned labelling. Has anybody, anybody in this room ever consumed something called Irish whiskey? That's with an E, by the way, not with just the Y. Um, that's protected, and under EU law, there's various documents that go into the European institutions, and it said it has to be produced where? On the island of Ireland. And the same with Irish cream liqueur and things like that. Now, that doesn't matter, really, does it? Because at the moment, it's all in the EU. Yeah? What's the possibility, and again, my crystal ball is working overtime, that once, if that part of the island is there and the rest of the island is still in Europe, is that going to be permissible? You will still be allowed to have Irish whiskey or Irish cream, but will it mean that it can only be produced in the 26, not the 32 counties? Question. If that's the position, does it all have to be done in the 26, not in the 32? We don't know. What about things like cattle, beef, milk? As far as I know, I mean, I, I, you, know, you can be a beef eater or not, it doesn't really matter, but as far as I know, cows aren't that great at reading signs, are they? This is the border. Dear cow, you must not cross that border. So you will have cows on farms that can go above and below the border. How might that impact, one, on what the business can say about it, but secondly, about the bigger trade things, about where things were produced? Place of last substantial transformation is one of the rules we talk about when we come to country of origin or, or place of provenance. Claims, health and nutrition claims, Front of pack labelling. I'm about to say, has anybody ever heard of traffic lights? But of course, I realise that most of you got here by road, so you would have seen them. But what I'm talking about is the traffic lights on the front packs of, of products that we have. Nutrition issues. And that's where we have to be quite careful in terms of pure law and regulation and policy. Because there are lots of issues that relate to policy, don't they? We've got the obesity strategy. Salt is bad for us, sugar is bad for us, apparently red wine is bad for us, but I'll take the risk on the last one. But how is the regulation and the policy going to stay to protect us as consumers? Animal welfare is a really big one, a really big one, because we've seen at EU level the rules around protection of animals at the time of killing, those rules have got tighter. The UK is now consulting on having things like CCTV in slaughterhouses. And there's the issues around religious rights preparations, so halal, kosher, where you have, again, the diversions of food and regulation, policy and religion. So animal welfare because the UK has said that it wants to tighten up its rules. If it tightens up its rules, I think as we've heard a few minutes ago, well, the, the, the standard might be the same, but if it's then going to cost me more, either in terms of the old pound, shillings and pence, or in terms of time, man hours, people hours, we're having issues already. And price fluctuation, and price fundamentally, was arguably one of the triggers for what? We've already heard about it this morning. The H word, horse meat. So price 
is something really important. And we'll come back to that in a second. More trade hurdles. Now, whether it's tariffs, whether it's quotas, whether it's tariff-related quotas, doesn't really matter. So what's the impact on the food chain? I am a food producer. My food product is made with three ingredients. I source them all from the current EU28. They can come and go as they please. I can put them into my product. I can then sell them within the EU. But what if one of my suppliers is in the UK? And my other two suppliers are in the EU. If there is any change whatsoever, any adverse change whatsoever for that ingredient from the UK, what does that mean for my product? It could be harder to source, could take longer to get here, there could be price implications. We don't know. What it does mean for business, and we'll come back to this towards the end, what it does mean for business is that they need to not be an ostrich. You have to identify where am I getting my stuff from and how much is it costing and are there any, any hurdles? Possibly afterwards, will any of that change? The food footprint, the carbon footprint, whatever you want to call it, am I going to have to search further away to get my ingredients? Is Brexit going to make people go further away to source their material? And what's the one thing that horse meat told us is we want a shorter food chain, not a longer food chain. Uh, the border, um, I think on the radio coming in this morning, there were some suggestions about other opportunities or other ways of resolving this. Um, the important thing to remember is that the UK is now going to be or will be a third country. And that has implications across a whole wide range of issues, including organisations like the FVO, the Food and Veterinary Office, who go out inspecting various uh, plants. I'm afraid to say there doesn't seem to be any, any alternative other than that will be the border between the EU and the UK. It'll be the Western border. So what do we do? Do we make the Northern Irish stay a separate customs area? Does it get special treatment? Do we have the island of Ireland as a special case, a special treatment? Now, there are lots of reasons why any of those are good. And there are lots of reasons why any of those could come into play. Apart from the P word, politics. And again, if I can, if I can plagiarise something from, from Alan's, I think, last or last but one presentation slide, which is, we over here might think it's great, the English speakers might think it's great, but they ain't going to think so much of it across the way. And we already know that there are issues around separatism in other EU countries. Now, for me, I said earlier on, will Brexit affect anybody? For me because I travel regularly between here and London, and London and here, when I get off the plane here, I walk along the corridor and I get to the, the sort of the customs where you show your passport and it's got EU passport and non-EU passport. For me, are you going to create a special third channel, which is, well, you're not one, you're not the other, but you're a special case. Now, one hopes that the common travel area, which is predates the EU, will stay. Um, otherwise, just think about me as a human being getting from A to B. If my journey is made harder because it takes longer, the implications on me are I have to decide, well, is this now worth me doing this job? And that's me, one individual. But what if you're a business? The world of food after Brexit. Well, we want all these, don't we? We want food to be safe, not misleading to consumers, legal, authentic. Um, there's a move, perhaps, in terms now of looking at food authenticity as a positive 
as opposed to things like food fraud, which implies a negative. And, and I'll leave that out there for you. We want it to be regulated, don't we? But what is the one thing, certainly from my perspective, what's the one thing that people say? After horse meat, what did they say? We must have more laws. More laws will sort it. A few more acts, a few more SIs, there we go. What we actually want is what's there to be enforced. But enforcement costs money. Whether it's at a BIP, a border inspection post, or just generally. That's going to be an issue after Brexit. For the UK, because the UK has never had to put BIPs in place, certainly in its EU days. It's now going to have to find resources to have its BIPs properly so called. And we need suitable trading conditions for business, but also for each one of us as consumers. There are implications for the supply chain I've touched upon, food security, criminal activity. The one thing we have at the moment is uncertainty. The one thing we might have afterwards is this ability now for price fluctuation, issues around that, and you will just have people stepping in, if I can be blunt about it, to rip off consumers. Well, you've paid an extra few quid for it. There you go. But it's the safety issue that's crucial. It's the safety thing that we have to be concerned about. We already know that things like methanol go into vodka and all sorts of things like that. The fear is that Brexit will actually allow that situation to crop up more. And if you have that opportunity, but if you have fewer enforcers, it doesn't take a genius, even I can work this out, fewer enforcers, bigger opportunity, bigger threat to me. I was going to do the chant, what do we want? We want it now. Yeah, we're not going to get it for, well, probably before I retire. But you may think I'm old. I'm old, but not quite that old. So there's a bit of a gap between now and my retirement. Um, and I got my dictionary out when I was doing this. And I thought, all the C words I can think of, we want clarity, we want certainty. We need consistency, confidence in the system, the food system generally. Compliance. Most food businesses are compliant and they strive for compliance. We want to make sure that that stays the same. Communication. We don't have that at the moment. What should we do? So I flicked through my dictionary and my thesaurus to find a number of P words. But what should we do? Prepare. Well, I've already touched on one thing in terms of where do we get our stuff from now? What's the rule? What's the regulation? What's the cost? What's the hurdle? If there is one, think about how it's going to option. Plans. Plan A, plan B. We need to be positive. We have to be positive. It has got to work, no matter what happens at the end of it, whether we are teetering on the cliff edge or whether we have a, a neat transitional. We have to be positive. Businesses, regulators, all of us involved in food science, food law, food regulation, we need to be in a position that we're going to survive. There's going to be pain. There always is with these things. And we've already seen issues around Brexit and, and currency fluctuations. Um, we need to minimise the pain. We need to prosper or else. We need some do's and don'ts. We need to be proactive. We have got to be proactive. Whether that's through trade organisation, lobby organisations, government, regulators, we've got to be proactive. This something is going to happen. We can't afford to procrastinate, we can't afford to be ostriches, and we have to ignore that lovely phrase, carpe diem, which is, ah, look, I'll make the best of today. What happens tomorrow will happen. We have to flip that on its head. Now, one of my earlier slides was Re Regulation 178, 2002. I've put it up there again, and I've taken out internal and community, because they're the two things that are particularly EU-specific. And we actually want the same thing post-Brexit that we have now, pre-Brexit, don't we? Um, that's me. I just want to finish with one thing. Um, and it goes back to another American politician, a chap called Donald... Um, oh, Rumsfeld, that was the fella. Was it known unknowns and unknown unknowns? Yeah? We have those at the moment, don't we? And I know people look at that, that sort of YouTube clip... Clip and, and sort of laugh at it. 
He said all that about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. But he also said this, the world is run by people who stand up, i.e. stand up and say what they have to say to get things done. We can only do that by standing up now and making sure that whatever happens post-Brexit benefits us all in business, in academia, but fundamentally as consumers. Thank you very much for listening. I'll take questions now or during the break or whenever.